I was going to, um, had it in mind that I was going to do a little bit of teaching given it's a Wednesday night, but um, the Lord saw fit to do other things with me, so we're going to do a little preaching tonight. Um, so if you will, let me get this thing set up here. Well, you'd think the last one who was me would have set it up right, but I didn't. So I'm going to fiddle with this real quick. If you will, turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18, a very familiar passage. Just thing settled out. First Kings chapter 18. Okay, we're on there. And if you will, go ahead and look at the last verse, verse 46 in First Kings chapter 18. And the Bible says, And the hand of the Lord was, upon, was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life as one of, the, uh, of them by, the, by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servants there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness." And came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, and a cruise of water at his, at his head. And he did eat and drink, and laid him down again, and the angel of the Lord came again the second time, and touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he rose, and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights, unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave, and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Brother Lucas, would you uh, pray for us and bless the message, please? Thank you, brother. We just read a familiar passage of Scripture. I believe most folks in here, if you grew up in church and you know anything about the Bible at all, you are familiar with the story of Elijah. It's probably one of the most preached messages in all the Bible, and uh, we started in verse 46, because I wanted you to see something here. What you're noticing here in the, in the passage, of course, we didn't read chapter 18, but if you're familiar with the Bible, you understand that Elijah just got through preaching probably the greatest message in all of the Bible as far as God showing up. Elijah preached the message and brought fire down upon the sacrifice, and you know the story. Elijah went up, and he cut off 450 uh, heads of the prophets of Baal. And so you see that picture, but then right after that, you see how you see the best day and the worst day of Elijah stacked right one against another. And, I, and, and this is a Wednesday night crowd, and I had debated about what to do and what to preach, and the Lord wouldn't let me get out of this one. And so I wanted to, to teach on the four branches and give you something midweek to tickle your senses a little bit, I guess, or you know, give you something, but the Lord said, no, you're going to go ahead and preach. And this is the Wednesday night crowd. This is the, the backbone of the church. And so it's interesting here because in the last days, you can see this, and it's a type. Look at verse uh, 19.3, and he went 
and rose that day and he went for his life. We understand that this is a type of the last days because that this know also that in the last days perilous time shall come. Shall, for men shall be what? Lovers of their own selves. And you see Elijah here in the self-preservation of the flesh because skin for skin all a man hath would give for his life. And by no means am I trying to diminish or make fun of Elijah. Because when you read this passage on the surface, and I remember when I was a young Christian, I read this passage and it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Okay, until I've gotten to experience a little bit more of the Christian life and experience a little bit of more about what it is to be a preacher and in the ministry, and you understand how a little bit of some things here about how Elijah ends up under a juniper tree. And so we understand that Elijah's got a problem. Well, in the last days, you're going to face the temptation to want to quit. Okay, this is the backbone of the church, therefore this message is for you. This isn't for a bunch of Sunday morning Christians who, who uh, don't, can't really take any preaching and can't really take any meat. This is for the backbone of the church. And so here's Elijah, and you see this right here, and he goes for his life, and he, you look at it and say, how in the world do you go from preaching the best message, the greatest message in all the Bible, and then all of a sudden some woman says she's going to cut your head off and you go run for your life. Well, folks, it's on the surface, it looks... A little bit odd. But if you dig deep into the scripture, you can begin to see some things that the Holy Spirit wants us to see. I want you to, to notice some things about the passage. And here's some, look at uh, 1842. It doesn't matter how much, how tough you think you are. When you apply enough pressure to anyone or to anything, eventually that thing is going to break. Amen? And so you look at, and I want you to look, first of all, in verse 42, and this is the first time those little cracks begin to show up in verse 42. It said, So Ahab, Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Notice this. And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. Look at his posture. Let me just demonstrate it for you. Here's Elijah. He just got done cutting off 450 heads of the prophet, so you have to give him a little slack. Okay? And he's here... And he's got his servant, and he says, go up to Carmel. Go up there seven times, and you see the posture of Elijah, and you see the pressure that begins to build on Elijah, and he's just about ready to break. And so, folks, there's, I can guarantee there's somebody sitting here tonight that is just about ready to break. Because the pressures of life, the pressures of the ministry, whatever it might be, I don't care who you think you are, enough pressure applied will eventually break anybody. Okay? I was changing the oil a couple weeks ago, um, a couple Sundays ago, and I got home from church, and I've changed the oil. I've got a Toyota, and uh, if you own a Toyota, you know that they have a, a certain type of... Um, it's an oil filter, but it's a container that holds an oil filter. It's not like the old twist-on type, all-in-one. No Toyota thought it'd be necessary to make a little, you know, container that you put the thing in, and then it's got a nut on the outside, and it's got another little gasket, and it keeps the oil in. And I don't know how many times I've changed the oil on that type of filter. I couldn't tell you how many times that I have done that. But here I was, crawled up underneath my, my, my van out there, and I was cranking on that little nut. You've got to put a 3 h extension in that thing, and you just turn it. It's made out of aluminum. And here I am, and I, I crank that thing, and it pops. See, on the outside, that thing looked like it was okay. But what you couldn't see was on the inside, those little micro-fractures that only you can see if you put it under a microscope or an x-ray, and you can begin to see those little fractures and those little cracks. And that's what you're seeing here in Elijah's life, just like when a dam breaks. You don't see it all at once. All, what you see is on the outside, it looks fine. But over time, and enough pressure applied, that dam will break, that little nut popped, and it rendered my van useless. And see, that's where Satan wants to try to get you to. He wants to try to apply just enough pressure so that you'll pop and you'll break and you'll do things that are out of character just like Elijah does here. And so when you're seeing those things, whenever you see somebody that's acting a little bit out of character, understand I can guarantee you that pressure is applied. 
That's what is causing them to act out of character, just like Elijah. And so you can see that here in Elijah's life. He had been going for so long. And notice this. Look at verse 46. The hand of the Lord was upon Elijah. It wasn't if he was outside the will of God. He's in the direct will of God, doing what God told him to do, and he breaks. So it's not always the ones that are out there sinning and the bad things. No, no, no. Many times, as a Christian, those things happen to you when you're in the will of God. You see, because one of the, one of the wiles of the devil, one of the tactics of the devil, if you will, is he, likes, he tries to wear out the saints. And that's what he will do. He will apply constant pressure because he knows every man has a breaking point. Every man will come to himself and he'll eventually break. And here's the thing you need to take notice of. When you see another Christian doing that, you need to pray for him. You need to bear one another's burdens. Because I can guarantee you that that pressure has been applied. And then here they go and they break. So we see that in Elijah's life. So we see the posture, we see the pressure that's been applied. But I want you to notice also in verse chapter, uh, chapter, 40, or chapter 18, verse 46, I want you to also notice that the hand of the Lord is upon Elijah, but he's so slap worn out that he can't even sense the presence of the Lord anymore. You see, when the hand of the Lord is upon you, you are to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. But what does Elijah do? He runs. Why? Because pressure makes you do things that otherwise you would not do. Notice that there's no prayer involved. The vo I can guarantee you this. I've got enough experience in this now to know that when, when you have a victory in your life, the best time, the most critical time to pray is after the victory. Yes, pray before it, but you better pray after it because you had better expect a counterattack. That was one thing we drilled in our Marines all the time. You had better prepare for the counterattack. Because I can guarantee you that the devil, Amalek, the flesh, all of them, they're not stopping. They're not afraid of you. They're going to come after you. So therefore, you had better pray. When you get a victory in life, you'd better pray for it. Amen. So Elijah, he doesn't feel the presence of the Lord anymore, even though the hand of the Lord is upon Elijah. Next comes the persecution. You just read it. You know the story about Jezebel? She says, I'm going to cut your head off. So here, you got to think Elijah, in his expectation, he thinks, I'm going to go out here. And if you read the, the previous chapter, he's pretty cocky in his message. He's mocking the other side. He preaches a, good, a great message. And what he's expecting to take place is this great national revival. And what takes place? Somebody wants to cut his head off. So immediately, he gets discouraged because of lack of results or his expectations were not met because maybe the pattern that Elijah had in his mind is not exactly what God had in his mind, what was going to take place. Just like John the Baptist who came in the spirit and power of Elijah said, Lord, are you him or should we look for another? I know you're the Messiah, but what am I doing here in jail? You ever felt like that as a Christian? I'm talking to the backbone. You're serving God, you're serving God, and you think, okay, everything's going to be a bed of roses, and in fact, it's just a bunch of thorns and thistles, and you wonder, what happened to me? Well, the Lord does that because He loves you. Why? Because you're, 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 He's counting you worthy to receive something in the next world, in that kingdom to come. See, you're here to suffer. You're not here to reign. But heart, sometimes when, you're in, when you are in that storm, it is hard to see that. So Elijah here, when persecution comes, he's not ready for it. Just kind of like the apostles when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane. See, when the Lord told them to wash and pray, what did they do? They went to sleep. You know what the church is doing right now? She's sleeping. She's thinking everything's okay, it's hunky-dory, and they're not prepared. So when the persecution comes, you know what they're going to do? You know what they're going to do? They're going to flee. 
Because skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his life. And so we see that here. Another illustration. Now it's 20-something years ago now. Life is, is truly but a vapor. I remember when I was in... I was in an infantry squad leaders course. It was actually in 2001, and I was, it was right after 9-11. And I was going through some training. We were doing some urban training. And um, the instructors like to play little games. They like to throw smoke at you, but they sometimes would mix in with the smoke CS. And if you know what CS gas is, it's a riot control. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's an irritant, to say the least. Um, if you get that stuff in your lungs, immediately you want to get that stuff out of your lungs because it sucks all the oxygen. You can't breathe and you, makes you, and you will vomit to get that stuff out of you. So we were in this uh, training event and, and we went into uh, being a couple uh, team members. We dumped into a building and nobody liked to wear gas masks because they're cumbersome. Okay, They're not a whole lot of fun to carry on your leg and it slows you down and you want to be as fast as you possibly can. You want to be able to run like Elijah. And so we didn't prepare correctly. And so we dumped into the building and there was a big old cloud of CS gas. And I can remember vividly to this day, the first thing I did, big tough Marine, is I took, took, <laughs> took, took tail and ran out of the building as fast as I possibly could. My helmet went one way, my rifle went another, and I was running the 40-yard dash to get as fast as, as possible away from that gas as I could. And I'm over there snotting and everything else, you know, it's a pretty sight. And everybody else that was in there was in the same boat that I was in. But I look at that thing and I think about, had I just prepared, had I just had that gas mask, who may have slowed me down in the moment, but when the trouble came, I would have been prepared. Much like your prayer life. You see, the first thing to go in these times when you get busy is going to be your prayer life. So when the trouble comes, you're not going to be ready for it. And that's exactly what you see here. And I was taught this, this principle many moons ago. But if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Amen? Amen? And there's a lot of folks that used to come to Wednesday night service, but because the devil put so much pressure on you and the world and everything else, and you stop praying, you stop reading your Bible, and then one thing comes up and another thing comes up and you blame God and you stop coming to church and therefore you're not prepared for anything that comes down the road. Amen? Right, this place should be packed. Right? But it's not. So there's casualties of war, not necessarily because they're bad, just because they're busy. And Satan could care less how or why you get out. He just cares that you get out. Amen? So we see Elijah, we see the perilous times, we see the, the, the persecution I want you to notice verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Immediately, he gets alone and he gets depressed and he begins looking at the past and he starts looking at his predecessors and he starts getting depressed because he says, I'm no better than them. I haven't achieved what my fathers have achieved. Instead of doing what Paul said and forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. But oftentimes, once again, when you're in the storm, it's easy for me to preach that. It's hard to live. See, that's where the devil wants to get you is down to that point to where you're ready to stick a gun in your mouth and end it. Amen. And I can guarantee you there's better men than me have done exactly that thing. Some of those were preachers. Some of those were missionaries. How'd that happen? Pressure. Pressure of life. Pressure of the ministry. It's not just preachers. How about parents? 
There's sometimes things can get so bad in a, as, a, as a parent that sometimes you feel like such a failure that that right there is your, is your juniper tree. And that's where Satan wants to take you to. And if he can get you there and keep you there, he would love nothing more. So here he is. Here's Elijah. He said, I'm no better than my father's. He wants to take his own life. But notice verse 5. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. I want you to notice the Lord here. This is, this is the angel of the Lord that comes and he touches Elijah. He recognizes the need. I'm going to give you a real theological nugget here. Number one. Elijah needed some rest and he needed some food. See, the Lord understood that he needed to minister to his physical needs first before he was ever going to be able to take anything spiritual. That's why the Lord gave us the seventh day to rest so that you could be refreshed. See, in this world in which you live in, especially as an American, you get so busy doing other things and they might be good things like Martha. But you don't do what Mary did. You forget the best part is to sit at Jesus' feet. And sometimes you need to be reminded of that, but you cannot be reminded of that if you're out of your mind and you've had lack of sleep and you've had lack of food. So the Lord ministers to his physical needs first. Why? Because the journey's too great for you. You're going to have to get your head on straight, Elijah, before you can receive anything spiritual from me. You notice in John 21... When the Lord says, come and dine, everybody knows the passage. It's right before he asked Peter, dost thou love me? Right, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. But I want you to notice something about John 21 is that Peter was not going to be able to minister to anybody else until he was fed of the master first. If you're ever going to be able to do anything for the Lord, you must feed at the master's table before you can ever minister to somebody else spiritually. Amen. This is the importance of coming to church. I want you to notice something else about the passage to Elijah's credit. It's another theological nugget. He's not picky. See, when God put something in front of him, he didn't just start picking through the menu like most Christians do. He didn't start looking at it going, well, I wonder who's preaching tonight. Well, the big, you know, the big preacher ain't there. So I think I'll just lay out a church. Because, you know, I've been, I've been eating steak and lobster for so long. I don't want any of that chicken. Amen? That's how Christians are. They're picky. We got that ministry down there at Carm, and we go every other week and... And we have a, a Brother Dale Dotson. He has a ministry. It's called Hold the Rope. And he gets a lot of uh, donations from other churches and, and food and clothing and those kind of things. And he, we, we set these uh, boxes out for him. And uh, it drives Brother Dale nuts. Because you get a lot of these homeless people that they come up and they start pilfering through stuff like a bunch of Christians. And, and you know, what's this? What's that? You know why? Because they're a bunch of fat cats now. Yeah, because they've been fed so long. Now they start picking through things. But you know, here's the thing. If you're hungry, you'll eat whatever God puts in front of you. No matter who it is that's preaching it. But the problem is, you're not hungry enough. Once again, go back to the microfractures taking that spiritual inventory of your own life. First thing to go is prayer. Next thing to go is Bible study. Next thing to go is Sunday school or Wednesday night service or whatever the case may be. 
Because why? Because you're a fat cat. You're lukewarm. You're right. Amen. And I'm talking to the backbone of the church. So what am I saying? I'm saying to you right now, don't fall prey to it. Don't quit. Know ye not that your labor is not in vain. Amen? But notice, Elijah's not picky with the meal, but you know who was picky? Peter. Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Not so, Lord. Peter, I thought you learned your lesson when I told you before, and I quoted scripture to you, Peter, that when they smite the shepherd, the sheep are going to scatter. And you said, not me. I'm the big shot. I'm going to be the chief apostle. Look at my position. I've been hanging out with Jesus Christ. Yeah, and it's the very one telling you what's going to take place, Peter. See, but had you been in your Bible, instead of sitting over here looking at your position, and you've been in prayer, you would have understood that that was the will of the Father. But because you refuse to get in, because you know what, oh, you, you're a big shot now. You don't need to read your Bible. Oh, you've been to Bible college. Oh, you're a preacher. You don't need to read this book. That's, that's for everybody else. And so here's Peter unprepared, and he leads a bunch of other people astray because of his lack of fellowship and listening to the Lord. And so here again, arise, Peter, kill and eat. Not so, Lord. Peter, once again, here you are. Here, you're the chief apostle, and I'm using you. But when I say to do something, you do it. Because once again, Peter, had you been in your Bible, you'd understand the practical application I'm giving you is from Hosea chapter 2. The four sheets, great, at the knit, uh, knit at the four corners, creeping things, fowls of the air, so on and so forth, right? And he said, I'm going to make a covenant in those days. That's a type of the Gentile, Peter, but you haven't been in your Bible in a while. You've been out here being a big shot. You've been out here doing these different things, doing the ministry, but you haven't spent time with me, Peter. Amen? Amen? So he misses it once again. So what does God have to do? He says, okay, I want you to preach to this Gentile dog over here. What's going to take place is in the middle of your preaching, they're going to believe on me, Peter, not you, and they're going to get saved. And guess what? I'm, because you're so unbelieving, i got to have a bunch of Gentiles speak tongues in front of you, speaking your language so that you'll believe it. Just to wake you up. And by the way, I'm going to call this Saul of Tarsus out because he's going to do my will. He's going to do what I tell him to do. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Right away. Amen? So we see Elijah. He's not picky. But we see in verse 8. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of, the, of that meat forty days and forty nights into whore of the man of God. At least he's not picky, but Elijah still has a problem. He's trying to go to a place to relieve pressure instead of looking for the person. Notice he goes from one cave. He goes from the juniper tree, a dark place, to a cave. Because he still hasn't figured it out yet. So the Lord, verse 9, has a probing question for him. What doest thou here, Elijah? I want you to notice his response. In verse 10, he says, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. Notice this. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. You see the perspective? It's inward. But you also notice this. You can always tell when somebody's out of fellowship because you know what they start doing? Pointing the finger. It's them, Lord. They're the problem. It's all the queers. That's the problem. It's all of them up in Washington. That's the problem. That's not what I asked you, Elijah. I asked you, what are you doing here, Elijah? 
I'm not worried about them. I've got 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to the image of Baal. You're not the only one. But what are you doing here, Elijah? What was he do? He was looking for a pattern. See, he was going down to Horeb or Sinai. He was looking for God to show up the same way he did when he gave the law. He was looking for him to show up like he did at Mount Carmel. But that's not how the Lord showed up. Look at the passage Look at the passage in verse 11. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount of the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains. It's hurricane season. That must be a sign from the Lord. And breaking, rock, er, and breaking pieces the rock. But the Lord is not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. Well, there's going to be earthquakes in divers places. Listen, folks, you're not in the tribulation. That's Matthew 24. That has to do with the time of Jacob's trouble. He's not in that. That's just birthing pains. But the Lord is not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord is not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened unto you, but rather rejoice. See, the Lord was not in all those exterior things. What he was trying to get Elijah to understand is that, here's your problem, Elijah. If you're going to serve me, you're going to have to be close enough to me to where you can hear that small, still voice. Not all the noise going on around you because although those things may be taking place and going on, what you really need is you need fellowship with me. You need the presence of God more than the power of God when you're in the storm. Amen? And so, you know how the rest of the story ends if you read your Bible. He's not done with Elijah. Even though Elijah failed, even though Elijah went and sat under a juniper tree, God wasn't done with him yet. Thank God he wasn't. Because I thank God for Elijah because it gives me hope as a preacher. Because you think I don't fail? You think you're not going to fail? Yes, but God still has a purpose for you. Amen? And you see it here. We know the story. And he looked down at verse 19, 19, 19. He says, so he, let, so he departed and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he with him the twelfth, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, and for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. And then, arose, then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. What the Lord gave Elijah, Elijah was Elisha. He gave him a protege. He gave him a pupil. He gave him a partner in the ministry. He gave him a young man who was willing to sell everything out and follow and be the water boy and hold his bags for the next 10 years. See, here's, everybody loves to quote Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them that who are thee called according to his purpose. But see, there's a practical application of Romans 8, 28. See, there's a past, there's a present, and there's a future application of that. See, what Elijah learned in the past was when he was down there at the brook of Cherith, and he, he went down there and he was fed by ravens. And that physical food was sustaining him. Just like here in chapter 18 or 19. And Lord is trying to teach him a lesson that you need to trust the provider more than the provision. And because he was fed physically and kept alive, he was going to go to a widow woman at Zarephath and he was going to be able to do the same thing and teach her how to trust the provider more than the provision. And then in the present... In the storm, when you're in the storm, you're not looking for the power, but the presence of God. 
When Paul was in that ship, who showed up? The angel of the Lord showed up. It was the presence Paul was seeking. It wasn't the power. The power comes, but only with the presence of God. And then we have a future application. We see Elisha, he was taught by Elijah to not seek the physical mantle of Elijah when it fell from the chariot of God, but to seek the person driving the chariot, which is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself. That's who you, he said, where's the God of Elijah? He was taught something by that old man. And for you sitting here tonight, there is a future, there's a generation coming up behind you and behind me that needs to see some, some folks that get a hold of God and they understand that the presence of God is the most important thing that you can possibly have in your life after you're saved. It is that fellowship because without that you have nothing. Amen? So, what's the problem? Well, he figured out the problem. We just explained it in detail. But I want you to take that home and I want you to meditate on that. And I hope that it helps somebody in here tonight to not give up the fight, to not quit. And just as menial as you think whatever task it is that you are doing, it means something to the Lord. Amen? Well, let's all stand. We're going to turn the service back over to Brother Barry. And I thank you for it, brother. And if, if you need to do business with the Lord tonight, the altar's open. Now, thank you for listening. Father, Lord God, we just thank you, Lord, for this time, this message. I thank you for the clarity of thought that you gave me tonight and the liberty. I pray for all those in attendance tonight. I pray that you'd bless them, help them, help them to not give up, give up the fight, to not be a casualty of war like so many others, and to be able to minister to one another. And Father, we just thank you. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake, we ask it. Amen.